My name is Matthew Brown, and I'm a composer and also a tenor with the Los Angeles Master Chorale. I think it, it started, you know, when Grant uh, approached me to write a piece for the Choose Something Like a Star program. I started thinking about stars and my own interest in astronomy, cosmology. Um, it was really sort of a hobby. And I was looking for different poems and things like that and didn't really find, I found some that I liked, but didn't really find anything that I thought would fit. And it was a lot of, a, lo a long process of, um, thought about it, and I saw that it, last year it was the 45th anniversary of the Voyager spacecraft, and um, I, you know, had followed them for a long time. I grew up with their imagery. They were the first probes to visit the outer planets, so that's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and also their, their moons, and I thought about the challenge of doing a piece that was largely wordless, um, so no poem at all, really, um, just a sort of sonic exploration with the choir um, and trying to depict these different worlds that Voyager visited. Um, and so it, it kind of grew from there. So one of the main Things I wanted to do with this piece was try to expand on a couple of other pieces I had written in previous years, one called uh, Demon and one called Pachim, both of which used um, non-specific pitches. So in other words, you might have asked the choir to sing kind of high or medium or low, and so you get a certain degree of indeterminacy or chance in it. Um, and also trying to explore other timbres. Um, you know, and I think that one of the things I challenge myself to do in writing choral music, I always want to try something new with each new piece I write. And that could be something really simple, it could be a new poem or a new type of, type of uh, texture I'm trying. Um, but I really am interested, especially with this piece, in expanding the vocabulary of choral music in, in my own work and hopefully inspire others to do the same. I think as a vocalist, it's something I love experimenting with. Um, you know, one of the things you hear as a professional chorister um, is people warming up backstage. So one of the sounds you'll hear in the piece um, is for uh, when we visit Io, which is one of Jupiter's moons, which is volcanic. And it's actually the most geologically active body in the solar system, believe it or not. And you'd expect it to be really cold because it's so far out, but Jupiter's gravity is such that it pulls on it and squeezes it like a, a tennis ball or something like that and heats it up from the inside. And so one of the sounds um, that you'll hear there is uh, people doing what's called a lip trill, which sounds like <laughs> that kind of thing. So you can imagine a bunch of sopranos doing that, kind of like bubbling to the surface. And then the other parts of the choir are doing sort of a version of overtone singing, if you've heard of that. Um, various traditions, like around uh, Tibet, you might have heard this done. And it's kind of like a, a sound where you get extra notes on top of the notes you're singing, so almost like two pitches at once. And that sounds something like... So you can hear I'm getting some higher notes in there maybe. So you can imagine a choir doing that. It's something I used to do on long drives to, for my own sort of amusement. And it's something I've always wanted to hear the master chorale do. So there's, there will be some of that in the piece. There's also a lot of really traditional, um, you know, pretty straight ahead choral singing. Um, since they aren't really on a text until the very end of the piece, um, there are a lot of vowels that are specified. There are non, um, pitched sounds like clicks and the sound of you know ice cracking on Europa, that kind of thing. So it all has to do with my impression of these various worlds. Um, and hopefully that'll come across to the listener. So for a long time, I've wanted to write a piece for choir and synthesizer. Um, 
I love choir, I love synthesizers, being a child of the 80s, and um, I thought with this piece in particular, since Voyager, you know, when it was launched in the late 70s and making these journeys throughout the 80s and 90s and still today, to include that in the piece. And so the piece includes um, a track that'll be played back live, um, which includes a lot of different types of sounds. One of the types of sounds are actual synthesizers, some hardware synthesizers that I own, one that will be played uh, live by our accompanist, the fantastic Lisa Edwards in the piece, and um, as well as various virtual analog modeling synthesizers, um, not to get too technical, um, so you'll hear a lot of those sort of familiar synthesized sounds and then other synthesized sounds that are maybe less familiar. Um, and the idea was to kind of, um, at least one of the ideas, was to blur the, um, the line between human and machine, you know. Um, for me, that is, is one of the things at the heart of the piece, I think, the fact that we sent these machines out, but we also put a record of our own humanity, you know, this golden record that you might have remember from, you know, learning about. Um, Carl Sagan was a big part of that, and it was called The Sounds of Earth. So if you can imagine trying to sum up the human experience in a record, um, it's an impossible job, right? Um, so I, there are samples from the Golden Record as well that are included here, which some of which have been processed um, in a way that um, makes them sound more sort of like synthesizers. In some ways, I'm treating the human voice like a synthesizer, you know, like doing things like filtering, um, various overtones and various vowels and things like that. Um, so it's, um, that's sort of the main thing. So you'll hear some synthesizers and various samples. Some, uh, I even made synthesizers out of my own voice, singing, you know, various overtone chords and building it. Um, you'll hear um, a little bit of the sampling of uh, some of the music from, that was included from all, from all over the world, all of different eras. Um, and it's kind of embedded and woven into the texture as a whole. So um, choir and synthesizers together at last. So, you know, I, I've had this lifelong, I think, love and fascination as have many people with space, you know, just looking up. Um, being from California, um, unless you're in high up in the mountains in Yosemite or somewhere, you usually don't see many stars or planets, right? There might be a few, but with all the light pollution, it, it's hard to, to find. But um, it, I've always been fascinated by it. I remember taking a, uh, an astronomy course in college because I had a few units to spare or something and looking through a telescope, even just at the moon, and seeing it in such detail as it, it kind of leaves you breathless. And, to think about stars, um, that our sun, for instance, um, is kind of an average star, you know, in, in terms of the galaxy and the universe. Um, it's, you know, there are many stars many, many times larger, which is hard to believe since a million Earths could fit inside our sun, as an example. And so, um, you know, in the Robert Frost poem, from which the title of this concert is taken, um, stars are depicted as something we can, you know, set our, our beacon to, something that's unchangeable. And, you know, on the scale of a human life, they are unchangeable, right? Um, we don't really see them move. It's something we take for granted that the sun will rise and set every day. And, but in, in terms of astronomy, on, on astronomical time scales, stars are colliding all the time. There are black holes being formed. There are stars exploding. And all these various things, stars being born as well, and we can see this looking back in time. Um, so to me, I think, on one hand, I find them um, almost, um, you know, just unknowable, really. Um, you know, just almost beyond imagination, both in terms of their scale, how large they are, how bright they are, how distant many of, most of them are. Um, even our own sun, uh, the light takes eight minutes to reach Earth at light speed, you know, and the closest star is about four light years away, if you can imagine. Um, and so just about the scale, I think it, it on one hand, you know, it's, it's um, something we can look at and marvel, but also I love that there are scientists out there whose job it is to find out more about that, to find out what we don't know. 
And I find that really inspirational. Um, and I think by looking outward, I think it, it invites us, at least it invites me to look inward as well, to, you know, thinking about the last picture that Voyager took, the famous pale blue dot photo taken from about four billion miles away. And Earth is just, it's smaller than a pixel. And to think about, you know, that everybody you've ever known or whoever will be has lived on this little tiny speck of dust, you know, in the blackness of space. And I think that makes, um, you know, our own perspective here, you know, our lives more precious, more meaningful, I think, to think of it that way. It's easy to feel kind of insignificant, maybe, but I, I think you could look at it the other way just as easily. And I hope people will find some of that inspiration that I find. I hope that comes across in the music. I mean, I think it's impossible to depict these things musically, really, like on the, you know, thinking about what would it be like to look at Jupiter out of a spaceship window? You know, I think you just, you wouldn't have any words, right? And so um, just to try to, as many composers have done throughout the centuries, to um, have a little bit of that sense of awe and um, reverence and just, you know, contemplation that I get when I look up. Well, you know, writing Voyager, it turned into this, you know, really kind of um, grand vision, you know, and a lot of difficulties along the way in writing it. You know, some technical things, you know, adding the live um, playback element. There's also a video that you'll see, which I thought was important just to see these, you know, beautiful images that Voyager took, but also to kind of give some context to the sounds you'll be hearing since there's really no text until the very end but it's an important text and I think it'll make sense for people um, when they see it and hear it. Um, I, I think what I would love people to get out of it, um, I hope they feel inspired by it. I hope that, you know, inspired both in terms of wanting maybe to learn more about these missions and what uh, organizations like uh, NASA and JPL and the European Space Agency and all these wonderful organizations are doing right now. Um, and find inspiration there. Um, but also to think about our own place in the cosmos. You know, these really big questions that we all ask and maybe sometimes forget about in our day-to-day -day life. But, um, but think about where we are, you know, as, as humans on this, this planet, our relationship with each other, how we treat each other, how we treat the planet. I think there are all these things that come into it. Um, you know, when you're thinking about these and marveling at these amazing um, discoveries that were made. I think, you know, I, I see um, a strong relationship in, in parallel between art and science. Um, I think that throughout the centuries, um, artists have um, tried to push forward in some way, even if it's in small ways, some, some push harder, some maybe less, um, but trying to really um, build on what people have done before you. You know, you've heard the phrase maybe standing on the shoulders of giants, which I think um, it was maybe Isaac Newton or someone was referring to him, but you know, a lot of people have used that phrase. And I think that's true of the sciences as well. You know, people are always trying to find out truth um, and to find out um, what they don't know. And I think, you know, as a composer, uh, I think, you know, the more I learn, I feel like the less I know sometimes. Um, and, uh, but also wanting to capture what I feel is an adventurous spirit that these scientists have, you know, wanting to, to know the unknowable, right? Um, to think back, of, you know, about, just take astronomy, which is, you know, what this piece kind of revolves around. Um, and what our understanding of the cosmos was 100 years ago, or 200, or three, or four, or a thousand years ago, and how that has changed, how it will change in the future. And I think um, science is a huge part of being human and being inquisitive and wanting to understand ourselves and our environment. Um, and I think the same is true of art. You know, art can be so many different things to different people, and it's it can be so subjective. Um, whereas, you know, science can be more objective. But I think both of these spheres um, invite creativity and exploration.